Thank you for allowing me to be here to present data from our lab. I do have uh, one disclosure. We were gifted um, this ALT803, which is a proprietary uh, reagent from Altor Bioscience, but we did not receive any monetary funding from the company. So the goal of our lab is really to study um, the immune system and to harness the immune system, specifically natural killer cells, um, to fight and hopefully cure cancer. Um, so what is a natural killer cell? It, in immunologist terms, is a, non, is a cell that has the capability to do non-MHC-restricted killing of virally infected and malignant host cells, which basically means it's a cell that doesn't need any sort of prior antigen exposure or sensitization in order to effectively kill. Uh, we study natural killer cell immunotherapy, which basically means we take blood from a cancer patient and isolate the NK cells, expand them and activate them ex vivo, and then take these highly activated cells and adoptively transfer them back into the patient. Uh, we are fortunate enough to um, have a work relationship with UC Davis where we get to work with actual um, canine uh, cancer patients, and dogs are a great a model to study cancer because they are immunocompetent and they still spontaneously form cancers, just like humans. Uh, we recently finished the first in-dog clinical trial uh, using um, autologous NK transfer in the setting of uh, radiation therapy. And in this, we recruited dogs with osteosarcoma, uh, and we basically did injections of their own NK cells along with um, IL-2 and looked at their outcomes. So one of the questions that arose from this study is how, how can we better optimize our natural killer cells so that they can target and fight cancer better, and how can we promote them to survive um, and function well in vivo as well? Uh, usually um, cytokines are used to support NK cells, and IL-2 is the current gold standard. It's a soluble cytokine. Um, and it, it works great to activate and expand NK cells. However, um, there's a high systemic toxicity, and patients don't tolerate um, IL-2 therapy very well. And also, IL-2 stimulates uh, T, uh, regulatory T cells, which actually, actually suppresses NK cell function. So uh, I mean, more recently, people have turned their focus over to the cytokine IL-15, which uh, also promotes survival and activation of NK cells. And it is better tolerated in patients. And it also does not have the function of uh, stimulating regulatory T cells. However, the, the signaling mechanism for IL-15 is very complex. It requires the cytokine to be bound to the receptor um, on a presenting cell, and then for there to be two cells to have a transpresentation um, relationship, which may or may not uh, make the clinical use difficult. Um, and so this company, um, Altor Bioscience, has developed a, what we call an IL-15 super agonist complex, uh, which is basically the IL-15 cytokine attached to the receptor, which is then bound to the constant portion of an immunoglobulin. And this serves to make uh, the cytokine actually soluble, um, have a longer half-life, and also to keep the transpresentation that is uh, their physiologic uh, way of signal transduction. So one of the first aims that uh, we pursued is do our dog and case cells actually respond to human cytokines? And the basic schema of our experiments were that we take <laughs> dog whole blood and we isolate the PBMCs or peripheral blood mononuclear cells and incubate those cells with cytokine in order to enrich for the cytotoxic cells. And then after that we would then mix those cells with dog tumor targets and our primary readout was a killing assay to assess how much of the tumor targets were able to be killed. And our goals were to look at dose response with the various cytokines and also timing of administration of the cytokines. Our first uh, major results uh, are that um, human dog and human PBMCs do respond to human IL-15. Human, as expected, has a very robust uh, killing of uh, target tumor cells, even at very low doses of IL-15. Um, and uh, dog PBMCs also uh, responded to the human IL-15, although it did require higher doses of um, the IL-15. And then we also looked at this um, ALT803, the super agonist, and we were also to, able to show a dose response um, in killing uh, with dog PBMCs and their tumor targets. 
So in all these experiments, the tumor targets we used is a canine thyroid adenocarcinoma cell line that's commercially available. Um, and, but we really wanted to make sure that our studies and RNK cells can kill uh, cancer cell lines that reflect more the spontaneous cancers that patients actually uh, develop. And so we also used um, dog PDX, or patient-derived xenograft tumors, to do our studies. Um, these tumors, we actually take cancer uh, tumor specimens from our dog patients and implant them into immunocompromised mice. And then from there, um, these cells are supposed to reflect the tumor heterogeneity and uh, uh, natural tumor biology better. And we can use those cells also to perform uh, functional killing assays. And we've shown previously that um, our NK cell population do kill uh, PDX tumor cells very well as well. So in the next series of experiments, we wanted to use this PDX model to look at NK response to cytokines in vivo. So we used uh, mice uh, with the tumor, PDX tumor-bearing mice, and we treated them with either no cytokine or with the human IL-15 or with the super agonist, and then also um, infused them with uh, dog natural killer cells. We measured the tumors over a few days, and then finally we, harvest, we sacrificed the mice, harvested organs in the tumors, and uh, ran flow cytometry to kind of see what happens to these NK cells once they are in vivo. Uh, we did see that um, we were able to recover um, these tagged natural killer cells, um, and we, we saw that at the tumor site, I, both the groups that had IL-15 and alt 3 had increased um, NK cell recovery, and we were also able to show that the percentage of the tumor cells that were dead was also increased in the IL-15 and the uh, super agonist groups. Um, throughout our studies, we, we noticed an interesting trend where uh, we saw that age had an effect on uh, the activation status of our NK cells. Um, we used flow cytometry um, to look at various activation markers, and we saw that using a standard IL-2 expansion of our cells, um, older donors actually had higher um, markers of Banzyme B and NKP46, which are activation markers, compared to um, the young. And uh, the, oh, excuse me, the uh, bottom right shows kind of representative flow cytometry plots. Um, flow cytometry is uh, you take uh, immunofluorescent uh, labeled antibodies and you mix them with the cells that you're wanting to study. And then uh, you can kind of see how, they, uh, how those antibodies will bind. And so the cells within that trapezoidal gate are the positive um, uh, cells that have that specific marker you're looking at. Um, and then we also wanted to see how um, our IL-15 and ALT803 uh, will affect activation as well, and does age impact that. And we did see that at day zero, these resting cells, they had very, very low activation markers. There wasn't any difference in young and old. However, after expansion and stimulation with either either of the cytokines, we did see not only an increase in the activation markers as expected, but that there was a difference between young and old donors, with older donors being more highly activated. Um, and then this is uh, kind of data that we looked back on the first clinic, canine clinical trial that we did to see if this trend that we saw in, our, um, in the dogs currently uh, held true for our clinical trial patients, and we did see that um, interferon gamma activation was higher in our older clinical trial patients than the younger. And so all of these um, data we're hoping will serve as um, kind of the groundwork for our next big step, which is um, a phase two trial of using inhaled IL-15 um, with autologous NK transfer in dogs. Um, and this uh, clinical trial is, will start um, anytime this year. Um, we'll be looking at the effects of inhaled IL-15 with NK transfer. We'll also be looking at subcutaneous injection of the super agonist with NK um, transfer as well. And uh, the hopes are to look at the response rates, progression-free survival, toxicity, and then also to study these um, NK cells and what happens to them in vivo once they are transferred.
Um, so in conclusion, um, we did show that uh, dog NKs do respond to human, human cytokines, including human IL-2, IL-15, and this uh, novel reagent, um, the ALT803 superagonist. And then donor age may be a significant biomarker in the activation and function of natural killer cells. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Any questions from the group? So do you plan on recruiting further um, patients in your groups were like two and four in your, in your patient study? Um, and what would your goal be and how would you determine that? So uh, for the next clinical trial and for the, the previous clinical trial, we did do um, very statistical analysis of how many patients we would need to recruit to have the power to actually make a statement. Um, and actually, the, the data that I showed with interferon gamma only had um, six patients total, but we did for the prior study have uh, 13 patients, and that was enough to um, at least show statistical, um, have a statistical analysis. And so we did that same sort of analysis for the upcoming trial as well. Thank you for a very nice presentation. I noticed that you were primarily looking at, um, uh, you were looking, basically flow cytometry shows you, right, the, the cells that express uh, whatever antigen your monoclonal antibody goes after, right? So it, it, do you have an idea of how this translates into actual um, level of expression and biological activity versus just cells that happen to express that marker? Right. So we do do, you know, PCR analysis as well. And then, uh, so the flow cytometry, the markers, yes, they show the frequency of how um, much a cell or a cell population will express a certain marker. And we try to correlate that with actual functional assays with the kill assays to see if um, you know, the, the marker expression that, that, that we see, does that correlate with actual functional differences as well? And so we try and mix um, various uh, assays like that. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present this work for you. Um, one disclaimer, the uh, Department of Defense and the Air Force don't necessarily uh, endorse everything that I'm about to tell you, and uh, that the work that is reported um, what did go through the appropriate IACO uh, procedures. So transacinic acid, or TXA, is a lysine um, isomer that has this really nice uh, ability to prevent or um, decrease the ability or decrease fibrinolysis, which as you can imagine, the trauma patient where you're hemorrhaging um, can be a very nice um, feature. Um, two major trials um, looking at TXA, uh, the CRASH-2 trial, um, which was a um, randomized placebo-controlled trial um, saw that they saw a decrease in the all-cause mortality with TSA. And the second trial, the MATTERS trial, was a, um, it was all at a military base. It was a retrospective um, sort of review of cases where patients had received a blood transfusion and received TXA or didn't receive TXA. And they found also lower adjusted uh, mortality with TXA, and even despite the fact that those patients were more severely injured. Um, and this was a lot of the, um, the data that was used to support the integration of TXA into the battlefield. Um, and it was actually codified in the TCCC guidelines in 2011. You can see an excerpt of those right there. And, and in those guidelines, it says that a gram of TXA is to be administered over 10 minutes via an IV infusion. Um, that's all fine and dandy if you have good IV access. But when I, IV access is either limited or poor, um, we really have to think of alternative uh, means to provide this medication to patients. So things that can affect your ability to obtain IV access, working under uh, night vision um, or blackout conditions, um, patients that are severely injured, hypovolemic, depleted vessels or depleted veins, um, and then just a lot of the battle rattle that our, our patients wear um, really inhibits the ability to obtain IV access in an expedient manner. <coughs> 
Um, and because of that, things like interosseous uh, administration and intramuscular administration of medications is very popular within the military. Um, uh, because of ease of access, uh, you can actually train somebody to do an I.O. In, in a relatively small amount of time. And in the case of I.M. administration, a lot of the auto-injectors that we use uh, basically have the instructions built right on the side and anybody can use them. So our goal was to really characterize the pharmacokinetics of TXA um, when they're given by these alternate routes if they don't have IV, IO, or IV access. And we did that in a swine model of hemorrhagic shock. Um, so our methods were we had 15 Yorkshire swine. Um, they underwent anesthesia, arterial and venous lines were placed, and they were then subjected to a 35% um, hemorrhage, and then allowed to equilibrate for about 15 minutes. And this equilibration uh, period actually was kind of twofold. One, yes, it allowed us to kind of monitor and, and make sure that they settled out and tolerate the hemorrhage, but it also uh, acts as a kind of a surrogate for what you'd expect to see in the battlefield. It may take about 15 minutes for somebody to get to a patient and provide them with um, access. At, uh, at time zero, uh, we, they were randomized to either IO or IV, IO, or IM routes. Uh, initial labs were drawn and then the TXA was administered. The TXA, uh, when it was given by IV, was given by the standard route, so IV infusion over 10 minutes. Um, in the case of TXA by IO and IM, um, they were both given as a bolus, and the IOs actually got a flush along with that bolus. We then monitored them and did interval blood draws over the course of uh, the next 300 minutes, or 300 uh, yeah, minutes. The, um, the TXA concentration was determined by liquid chromatography, mass spectroscopy, LCMS. And then at the very end, at T300, the final labs were drawn, and the shed blood was actually transfused back to the animal so that we could then recover them. They were recovered, observed for um, at least seven days, and then that was followed by necropsy, where we were really just looking at gross pathology, just seeing what, if anything, uh, was happening in the tissues uh, that the TXA was injected into. Um, so for our results, they, all the animals achieved a roughly equivalent uh, level of shock um, between the three groups. Uh, the mean hemorrhage volume was actually 38% um, of their blood volume. And if anything, the IV and the IM uh, routes actually had a tendency towards a little bit more profound um, hypotension. Um, but as you can see, they were all very, very hypotensive. The LCMS data showed that this gave us our curves um, to look at both IV, IO, and IM. And as you can see, IV and IO have a fairly brisk uh, upstroke. Uh, and then settle out to roughly the same as uh, I am over the long term, uh, right around 60 minutes. We were able to take this data and uh, plug it into Stata's pharmacokinetic suite, uh, which gave us basically a lot of the typical pharmacokinetic parameters that you'd expect to, to see. So in the case of uh, the time to peak, um, the IV and IO routes had a much decreased time to peak, as well as a much larger peak compared to I am. Uh, IM didn't reach its, its maximum value until about 60 minutes down the road. Uh, the TXA, TXA half-life was comparable between both IV and IM routes. It was actually a fairly uh, fair bit longer than the published norms for TXA, which is about 80 to 120 minutes. And then the, I, uh, the area under the curve was also comparable between the IO and IM routes, uh, but both of them were about 23% less than the IV route. A um, couple of complications to report. There were two IM animals that we had to euthanize early. Um, one was because of a groin hematoma at the uh, arterial line site that was causing pain. And one of the animals was just because of the duration of shock was so profoundly hyperkalemic that we didn't feel comfortable recovering that animal. Um, during our necropsy on the remaining animals, we did not identify any uh, gross changes in the tissues, whether it be uh, ecchymosis, necrosis, uh, liquefaction. Um, so the point I'd like to, you guys to take away from this is that all those routes, um, even though the IM didn't have a, a really brisk upstreet with the, or uptick with, the, with a nice peak, um, they all actually achieved the, the minimum um, level that's required for fibrinolysis to inhibit fibrinolysis. And that level is about 10 micrograms per milliliter. Um, and they all did that within about 10 minutes. The real question becomes is, you know, does this peak concentration matter? Does this area where they're seeing a larger concentration of TXA, um, does that matter to the, uh, the outcome or the efficacy of the drug? Um, the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, 
So in conclusion, the TXA serum concentrations did reach, uh, you know, what we would kind of expect, especially with the shunting of blood away from the skeletal muscle. Um, we did expect that the IM route would have a, a lower peak, but what we were um, not necessarily surprised by, but what we were happy about is that at least it reached a level that has the potential to be efficacious um, for inhibiting fibrinolysis. And that was all during uh, class three shock. Um, there appears to be what may be an actual depot effect when used in the IM route. Um, and when you think about this, this may actually be beneficial um, for a battlefield administration. Um, a, it's a lot easier to administer, uh, but B, if you have ongoing hemorrhage, if, you're, if you have a sharp uptick and you're having continuing blood loss, you're actually losing TXA along with that blood. Um, and so it may be one of those things where these, given, if we do this in a model where we're also incorporating an uncontrolled hemorrhage, some of these uh, values may start to level out. And then you start to think about prolonged evacuation times. Uh, the battlefield is shifting away from uh, established uh, hospitals um, that are uh, or, um, uh, EMEDs, as we call them sometimes. The, so we're starting to get into this phase of, of um, preparation where we may actually lose that golden hour um, that has been uh, so uh, significant for outcomes in, in, the, uh, in the Afghanistan and Iraq. Obviously, further study is required really to clarify the appropriate dose concentration. Again, this is a large kind of volume. A lot of times we don't think about a, a 10 milliliter sort of IM bolus. That's not a typical uh, volume in an auto injector. So certainly we need to look at the dose concentration and look at the pharmacodynamics or actually how efficacious it is in a model with more human-like coagulation profile. But the end goal that eventually we may be able to turn an auto injector into something where you can actually put TXA in there and, and, uh, and deploy that with our troops to the battlefield. Thank you. Great presentation. I, I, I have a, a question. Um, topical TS, TXA um, would have an immediate effect. Have you considered looking at that combined with your IM administration? Um, no, absolutely not. I, I'm not sure because that certainly seems like it would be one of those things where you could integrate that into something like quick plot. As, as an additive uh, effect, but um, in, in this particular instance, no, we have not considered that. Um, I was surprised to find, I mean, TXA has been around for a long, long time, both in topical applications, orthopedics, ob cardi uh, cardiac surgery. So it's, um, it's a fairly well-studied studied drug that's been found to be fairly safe in general. Um, and you know, I, was, I wasn't expecting to see a lot of tissue changes at the injection sites because we inject this into to knees and um, when they do sort of cloning the arthroplasty. So. The first one is when you did the necropsy, did you stain for any microthrombi? No, this was this purely gross. Um, we were doing one of the reasons that we pushed out the um, and did the necropsy. It was, sometimes it wasn't right at day seven, sometimes it was a week or two down the road. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we did that was actually to be able to reuse some of the animals as part of our reduction okay. of, uh, efforts. Yeah. So we, we, didn't, we didn't know what that would do as far as, because it wouldn't all be at day seven or day 14. Mm -hmm. um, so we did not go through any stain. And my second question, I, I had never heard the concentration of, what, of TXA that you need for to inhibit fibrinolysis. If it's that low, do you know why some of the, there's at least one pre-hospital study that has been ongoing for a while, I think now, that's looking at the, the dose, like two, three, and four grams? Uh, that, I, I don't know, I haven't seen that, but it's one of those things where I think it is important to do that, that sort of study to see, you know, do you get more efficacy from a larger dose? Um, but that value you showed is so low. Right, right. Um, your, that particular dose that, Came out, that was done. That work was done in the 60s. Mm -hmm. The dose that they were using was on the order of 10 milligrams per kilogram. Um, that was, and that gave them enough circulating mm -hmm. uh, TXA to inhibit fibrinolysis. So I'm not entirely sure that ramping up that dose is going to do anything, but it may be one of those things where we think that more is better. Um, it may not be necessary. Yeah, nicely presented, I agree. Uh, the pharmacokinetics of TXA were not known before? I'm, I'm sort of surprised. The drug's been around a long time. Yeah, the, the kinetics are known, but we don't know what it does in, in the setting where you're shunting blood away from the muscle. And, and most of the work that's been done has all been done with IV 
or PO administration. So IM has not really been looked at. And, well, with that regard, though, when it's looked at before, are these pharmacokinetics similar, the ones you saw in these uh, animal models? Very much, very much so, at least as far as the intraosseous stuff. And again, it hasn't been looked at with, um, with hemorrhage, even for the IO. It's all been normal um, sort of. I guess that was my question, was how much the hemorrhage affected the pharmacokinetics of the drug? Um, I think for, we also, we did a pilot study, or uh, actually Dr. Davidson did a pilot study looking at this in animals that we had not um, hemorrhaged, and those curves were actually very similar. We actually had an uh, uptick in the IM administration. It all seemed actually fairly consistent with what was in the... Uh, the, the and then the last thing, if I could, I just... Do you know how you how 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 do you set a mass spec machine to measure TXA? I mean, what is there a is there on the insert have a instructions or how do you know what to do? I mean, how it's where does that come from? Incredibly complicated. And I, I had very little to do with that part. Um, the, uh, but what my understanding is that you actually have a standard of you know aliquot of that particular um, drug or compound, whatever you're looking for, and then you you inject your material and, and you see all the spikes for everything that's in there so whether it be, you know everything that the pig got whether it be the anesthetic the uh, pain meds that we give it before and after that all shows up as a spike and you basically quantify based upon the, the height of that spike that matches with your standard great thank you great talk thank you and thank you for the opportunity to present so blunt thoracic trauma is a common and challenging injury that affects 10 to 17 percent of all trauma patients and is responsible for 20 to 50 percent of the nearly 200,000 annual trauma deaths that occur every year. Pulmonary thromboembolic events are a particularly troublesome complication following serious trauma, especially the blunt thoracic trauma patient. In fact, reports have shown that patients that have experienced a blunt thoracic trauma are actually twice as likely to be diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism in comparison to other trauma patients. Conventionally, pulmonary embolisms are considered a complication of systemic venous thrombosis. Therefore, we have several expectations. We expect them to be diagnosed five to seven days after the injury, since first you must form your venous thrombosis allow time for it to break off, travel through the vasculature, and become lodged in the arterial, pulmonary arterial vasculature. We also expect that at the time of diagnosis of your pulmonary embolism, you should also have evidence of systemic venous thrombosis on radiography. But several studies in the trauma population have shown that this is not always true. In 2007, Scalia's group showed that up to 37% of patients are diagnosed in, with their pulmonary embolism in the first four days of their admission. Weigel's group actually showed CT scans done on the initial evaluation that had pulmonary artery vasculature filling defects. Further, Knudsen et al. did a large study looking at pulmonary embolisms in trauma patients, and only 20% of patients that were diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism also had radiologic evidence of a DVT. But despite all this evidence and the, of the contrary, we continue to fall back on this default diagnosis of pulmonary embolism, ignoring that this could be a de novo process of the pulmonary vasculature. To investigate this, we need to ask ourselves, what is a thrombus and why is it different than an embolism? A thrombus is defined as an aggregation of platelets and fibrin that are adherent to the blood vessel wall. Virko's triad has taught us that a thrombosis occurs when the endothelium is activated under conditions such as blood stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial injury. The activated endothelium then releases weeble pallid bodies these are secretory granules housed in the endothelial containing P-selectin and von Wildebrand's factor. These translocate to the surface where P-selectin has the ability to bind platelets, cause fibrin accumulation, and the initiation of thrombosis. Building upon this knowledge, we hypothesize that the activation of the endothelium and increased P-selectin expression is necessary for de novo pulmonary arterial thrombosis in the setting of blunt thoracic trauma. In order to test this hypothesis, we have developed a blunt lateral thoracic trauma model using a simple weight drop mechanism. In this model, an anesthetized mouse is placed in the left lateral decubitus position, 
A 50 gram weight is then dropped from a set height. Mice are then euthanized 24 hours later and gross necroscopy is performed. As you can see here, on growth pathology of the injured animal, obvious pulmonary contusion is seen. To further characterize the extent of the pulmonary injury, tissue sections were then stained with hematoxylin and eosin and evaluated for signs of acute lung injury. These um, parameters, or the parameters that we looked for at, were significant infiltration of inflammatory cells, alveolar hemorrhage, and increased alveolar membrane thickness. Each one of those parameters was given a score of zero to three with a total score of nine. Composite scores were elevated, as you can see, on both the right and left side, or the coupe and contra coupe sides of injury, with the greatest sides being on the coupe side of injury. Bronchial alveolar lavage fluid was obtained and stained with a right GIMSA. Total leukocyte counts were obtained as, and followed by a differential. Elevations were seen in total white blood cells, macrophages, neutrophils, and lymphocytes consistent with immune cell recruitment. On close examination of the arterial vasculature, an interesting acellular proteinaceous material was found to be associated with the vessel wall, suggestive of thrombosis. To examine this finding greater, similar sections were then stained with antibodies specific to fibrin and platelets. In this photo, the fibrin stains green and the platelets stain red. Therefore, yellow areas represent both fibrin and platelets. Fluorescent imaging of similar sections showed that this acellular proteinaceous material was also positive with platelets and fibrin consistent with clot at the intraluminal space. After noting that intermittent finding, we decided to go concentrate on fibrin deposition in the pulmonary vasculature. And these photos again, fibrin is green. A substantial number of pulmonary arteries in the injured mice had an accumulation of fibrin, and interestingly, it was found to be in an eccentric pattern or concentrated at the intraluminal surface of the vessel wall. This finding was then quantified by measuring the mean fibrin expression on the arterial wall and divided by the size of the arterial wall. We could see we had a two and a half time greater fibrin deposition in the injured arteries in comparison to our uninjured sham animals. To further confirm this was, that this was actually a thrombotic process and not just an embolic process, we wanted to, act to investigate the presence of a vascular activation molecule, or P-selected. As noted before, when the endothelium is activated, P-selectin translocates to the surface where it has the ability to bind platelets and initiate thrombosis. Interestingly, not only did we see increased P-selectin as we would expect at the intraluminal space, or as noted as the red in the middle picture, but we also saw an increased P-selectin in the vascular smooth muscle. This finding has been noted in other models of vascular injury. Again, this expression was quantified and measured and then divided by the size of arterial wall. We looked at 10 vessels on the right and 10 vessels on the left to make these measurements. To determine the role of this vascular activation molecule P-selectin, we then utilized a P-selectin blocking antibody. In this experiment, we still divide the mice into two main categories those that received our thoracic injury, and then those that went through the sham injury or the uninjured control. Those mice are then further divided into those that received a control antibody called the isotype antibody, and those that received the P-selectin specific blocking antibody. Again, we looked at fibrin accumulation in the arterial vessels. Here, the first column represents images from the mice that received the thoracic trauma but received the control antibody. In the next column, we have the mice that received the thoracic trauma but received the P-selectin specific blocking antibody. And the last two columns represent those animals that went through sham injury. First, those received that isotype and then the others that received the P-selectin blocking antibody.
These findings were again quantified, showing us increased fibrin deposition in our injured animals that received control antibody and decreased fibrin deposition in those that received the P-selectin blocking antibody. In conclusion, we have shown evidence that blunt thoracic trauma promotes de novo thrombosis. Furthermore, through the use of blocking antibodies, we have demonstrated a critical role for P-selectin in early eccentric fibrin accumulation at the intraluminal surface. Currently, the treatment of pulmonary embolisms hinges on the use of anticoagulation medications, which is obviously fraught with complications in our trauma population. As we gain a greater understanding of the conditions that drive this process, the hope would be to develop more targeted and effective treatments that could avoid the significant complications of systemic anticoagulation. Lastly, the incidence of pulmonary thromboembolic events is commonly used as an indicator of quality care for large surgical centers since it's considered a preventable complication of DVTs. Interestingly, despite the increased utilization of prophylactic measures, the incidence of pulmonary embolism diagnosis in trauma patients continues to rise. Our failure in preventing this complication should make us wonder if we're treating the right disease and if it really should be a complication at all. Perhaps pulmonary thrombus has a different natural history, making us question its use as an indicator for quality care. Take any questions? That's an excellent talk. Do you have any, are there any questions from the group? That's a really good talk. Thank you. So my question to you is you would you talked about contracoup injury. Are you sure it's just contracoup injury or are all the endothelium activated and P selectin is is um goes to the surface in all of the cells? Um, that is one of the main questions that we ask ourselves daily. And so I'm assuming what you're saying is it a localized injury yeah. or does it be a systemic Yeah, injury? and that my next question is a systemic. Have you looked at any other organs to see? So right now we're looking at kidneys. That's okay. kind of the next natural mm -hmm. area for us to look mm -hmm. at. It also has an interesting microvasculature with major arteries as well. Um, and we just started that, so I don't have any answers on that yet. But we do think there's a real possibility that this could be a systemic process, not just the lungs. Great job. Question: In terms of those, the the prior work with um, the de novo pulmonary thrombosis, what percentage of those? It's it's a high percentage uh, the prevalence that you find incidentally on imaging on these patients. What percentage of those are clinically significant? That's another big question that's um, actually being investigated by Dr. Knudsen and her group is the clinical significance of these. Um, I don't know the actual percentage per se. Um, but the one in her large study um, that looked at like 8,000 patients, those were all clinically diagnosed pulmonary embolisms that they then found evidence of the biological. So um, what kind of treatment did you do with your um, sham mice? So our sham mice go through everything except for the thoracic trauma. So that involves, um, we use um, isofluorine anesthesia through a nose cone. We then literally place them in the left lateral decubitus position underneath the weight, but we don't drop the weight. And then we put them back and we recover them, meaning we lay them and wait for their writing time, so the time for them to flip. And then they receive their pain medications just as the other um, injured mice do as well. And then they're sacrificed 24 hours later on. And also, um, so when you measure P-selectin, I only saw uh, like a one-time measurement of P-selectin. So um, have you done any like over time uh, measurement of P-selectin expression? Not My yet. You mean we've only looked at 24 hours right. right now? No, we hope to in the future continue to be able or to look, um, does this stay elevated for days or is it just a kind of an acute process? And we haven't gotten there yet. Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Bin Song uh, from Burn Unit. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about our research project uh, that inhalation injury have uh, impact on the blood transfusion uh, after burn injury in children. Uh, I have no actual potential 
uh, conflict of interest uh, to this presentation. Uh, so as we all know, burn injury is uh, often related to high ratio of uh, blood transfusion. Uh, several factors such as uh, device a burn uh, has been uh, associated with uh, blood transfusion. However, the impact of uh, inhalation injury, which is uh, uh, often associated with uh, adverse outcome in burns uh, on blood transfusion has had a limited study. So the purpose of this study was to uh, evaluate the impact of uh, inhalation injury uh, on pediatric burn patients, plasma infusion, risk, and outcome. 